manipulate that database, mm -hmm. okay. and that'll drive you towards larger internal magnetic disks where okay. you can transfer this large database onto the disk and modify it for your own application. So you see it as more of a complementary type yes, of technology than something that is a replacement, say, for magnetic disks. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Ellen, what are the technological problems, going back to hard disks now, in getting beyond, say, the 60 meg level where you are now? I mean, you've got four platters, you've got eight platters, but other than that, what can you do to get okay. more storage in there? Well, in addition to adding more platters, you can increase the track density, the number of tracks that you have across the surface. You can increase the bit density, the number of bits that you have around the surface. And you can also modify the encoding method, the efficiency with which you place the data on the disk. Now, as a consumer, um, we, uh, I guess in the past, have been worried about the reliability of, of disk drives. Now you're talking about packing it in tighter and putting more information in the same space. Is this going to affect the reliability? Do we have to worry again about head crashes and losing data and so forth? Well, I believe that it helps the reliability from the standpoint of higher performance, higher capacity disk drives allow us to put more drive technology into the unit. Mm -hmm. uh, better quality read channel, better quality media, uh, natural course of events of getting higher capacity forces a better design and a better so, quality so product. If I, have a, if I buy a drive like this and I put in my AT, can I just sit there and run it? And if I do it that way, how many hours can I expect it to last? Day um, day 15,000 hours is the quoted spec. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very reasonable number. Greater than that can be expected. Bob, we have about a, a half a minute left. What about the prices on hard disk drives? Are they going to fall the same way floppy disk drives have fallen? Well, they've already fallen a tremendous amount. Uh, after all, it was only about a year ago that a 10 megabyte drive was selling for $1,000, and now 10 megabyte systems are as low as, say, $395. Hmm. Okay, gentlemen, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Well, it seems like mass storage devices are like freeways. The more you build them, the more the traffic builds up to take advantage of them. Where will it all end? We asked our commentator, George Morrow, for his thoughts. Like freeways, money is another resource which is consumed as fast as it's created. Now, the computer industry has come to expect that memory density will quadruple every two years, a whopping amount when compared with money or freeways. For the semiconductor people, this means smaller geometries and larger defect-free crystals. But for the Winchester disk designers, it means getting four times the performance out of the treacherous world of magnetic flux. It means ever finer track densities and having to access those tracks with tricky electromechanical devices, stepper motors, springs, gears, and all the maddening problems with tolerances and mechanical resonances and the like. As if this were not enough, these designers know they have to make all this work while some reporter from InfoWorld or PC Week drops the drive a foot or so onto a desk in order to prove to his readers he's still on the trail of those problems with drives on the IBM AT. Not an easy life. I think it's time to say a prayer that these designers can keep doing the fantastic job we've come to take for granted. That's how I see it. I'm George Morrow. In the random access file this week, it looks like Apple will be unveiling a new upgraded version of the Macintosh next month. It'll be called the Mac Plus, and it will feature one megabyte of memory, a double-density 800K disk drive, an expanded keyboard, and greater speed. It will also feature a new SCSI interface to make it easier to connect third-party peripherals. IBM is reportedly planning to cut the price of the PCAT. The reasons for the cut, a heavy AT inventory, softening of demand, and possibly the prelude to a new product. The AT price reportedly will be cut by about 20%. AT&T has announced that it has begun to manufacture new thin screen plasma displays for portable computers. The AT&T display is about one inch thick, weighs four pounds. AT&T says it can be viewed under all lighting conditions and within a 150 degree viewing range. Digital Equipment Corporation has announced its newest, fastest, and most expensive 32-bit Super Mini, the VAX 8650. DEC says it runs at some 6 million instructions per second and sells for about half a million dollars. Business appears to be picking up for Hewlett-Packard. HP plants in California and Oregon will be going back to full-time work after months of shortened work schedules and forced vacations. However, HP workers will be facing a 5% wage cut in return for the resumption of a full work week. Time for this week's software pick, and here's our reviewer, Paul Schindler. This really takes me back to my youth. Not real ping pong, of course, but a few years before that when I played my first video game, Pong. 
It was everyone's first video game, just like Life and Adventure were everyone's first computer games, and Eliza was most people's first exposure to a primitive form of artificial intelligence. In the computer game field, barely a decade old, the term golden oldie might seem a contradiction. But these four are golden oldies, and now they come in a single package. Golden Oldies is the first K-Tel floppy of a great old computer games. Remember Adventure with its keys and greats and directions? How about Eliza, whose answers can often be as frustrating as those of any Freudian analyst, picking a word or two from your answer and turning it back around on you? Then there's Life, the biology-based game in which the odds favor death, as they do in real life. The generations move quickly here. Finally, there's Pong, in both the original version and a new color version. I think $35 is a reasonable price to pay for this walk down memory lane, which is not copy protected. It comes from software country in Beverly Hills, California. Maybe they'll sell it through a special TV offer. We'll see. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. In our legislative update file, the Senate Armed Services Subcommittee has heard conflicting testimony from computer scientists on whether or not the Star Wars defense program can be adequately supported by the necessary computer technology. Scientists from USC and Bell Labs told the Senate committee that the technology already exists to support Star Wars. However, other scientists said the necessary software could never be adequately debugged since it could never be tested under real battle conditions. One critic also pointed out that the U.S. would be extremely vulnerable to espionage on the software code. The Japanese have come out with a progress report on their fifth generation computer project and the report says that progress is slow. The Japanese research team now says the fifth generation project research may not bear fruit until the late 1990s. The 5G project has been hit by budget cuts and some reluctance of Japanese companies to put their best scientists on the project. However, the Japanese say they have settled on a software format called the Guarded Horn Clause. No clues as to what that means. Meanwhile, computer scientists in Britain say they are making progress on their own fifth-generation project using what they call a functional logic language and transputers. The Brits say they'll have a machine up and running by 1988. Finally, the world's first ballet for humans and robot took place last week in Palo Alto, California. The original ballet, entitled Invisible Cities, featured nine dancers and a robot developed at Stanford. The choreographer said the robot performed perfectly. The review said the robot's performance was expressive, displaying a sensual lyricism. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by a grant from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. AFIPS, sponsors of OAC 86, the nation's leading conference on business technology. For conference information, call 800-OAC-1986. Exploring today's business solutions. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard.